Hi, I'm Damian Ma. Hi, I'm Bill Adams, and we're co-authors of In Line Behind a Billion People, How Scarcity Will Define China's Ascent in the Next Decade. We thought there was a gap in the discussion, the conversation about China in the United States today. We're not so much concerned with, with either China rising or with China collapsing, which are both, you know, at their, at their core, those are arguments about China's growth trajectory. Uh, instead, we thought that scarcity is a, a more important view of what's going on in China today than, than how fast is China growing. We also wanted to write a more comprehensive political economy book because, as Bill said, you know, there's, there's a tendency to focus a lot more on economics or pol politics as, as separate entities. We break down the concept of scarcity, which we think is very important to understanding China's uh, economy, China's politics, and Chinese society into those three different sections uh, to talk about um, what's going on in each of them and, and what are the interconnections between that that uh, scarcity brings out. Uh, in economics, uh, we're primarily focused on how all of the inputs to China's growth engine, this is the all the capital being invested in China, all of the natural resources being used in China, uh, the, the huge supply of labor in China. China used to have a labor surplus that's now gone to a, a, labor, uh, a labor hangover, really, uh, and uh, as well as uh, the supply of food even in China. Uh, all of those inputs, which were very plentiful for uh, the past decade, are now becoming scarce and changing the way that China grows. China is big enough that when China, uh, when there's something that's scarce in China, food, be it food or water or land, uh, it has global implications and it moves the prices of those goods globally. On politics, I think that's one area that some people may, may be a little bit confused by. What do you mean by political scarcity? And what we really mean by political scarcity is uh, institutional scarcity and the challenge of governance for China. Uh, you know, we argue that it's uh, the, the Chinese system right now is more of a 20th century system trying to govern a 21st century society that has grown up in a very different information environment and has grown up with, with a lot of technologies that, that, that frankly, the system didn't need to address uh, in, in the last decade or even in the last 30 years. So now they're going to have to really develop what the Chinese call software rather than just pure hardware. In our book, we talk about how there's a grand bargain in Chinese politics, or at least there used to be, where uh, the government provides growth and the citizenry uh, accepts uh, the existing regime and, and provides stability. And it's never been exactly that simple, but basically we think that the, the reasons why that bargain was acceptable, acceptable a generation ago are, are starting to break down. I think one of the important factors that's contributing to this uh, um, breaking down of the grand bargain is what we consider stark, huge generational discontinuity in China. There's, there are people who've grown up in a very different world, in a very different China, and you have people who, who are now coming, coming into, into the middle class who, who frankly have grown only under material wealth. So the idea of growth or stability is no longer as appealing, and I think they're searching for what we call post-material values. We are about one year into the new, new leadership of China led by President Xi Jinping and Premier Li Keqiang. And from, 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 from every public statement they, that they've made so far, it seems like they're certainly pretty much committed to fairly fundamental, serious economic reforms that, that, that is hoping to, to you know, rebalance the Chinese economy that will address some of the fundamental economic scarcity that we outline in our book. Now, well, it seems like they have some political will to, uh, to address the, the institutional challenges, the governance challenges, but frankly, that's a lot, a lot tougher. Uh, that's gonna, it, it's not that they don't have a blueprint. Uh, it, it's really an execution challenge, and there's clearly still a lot of political vested interests in China right now that don't necessarily want fundamental change and would prefer the status quo. China wants itself to be a great, respected power, and it is actively promoting soft power, uh, certainly for the last several years. And I think the, uh, the factors we've talked about in terms of ideological value scarcity in China, that's going to constrain its, its, its progress on the soft power front. And I think China's going to get into a situation where it's going to be perceived as economically very powerful, but it's not going to want to play a role that's commensurate with its, with its economic power. So I think it, it can get into a tricky situation where it has to balance both internal pressure for it to behave 
like a major power and also external pressure for it to behave like a more great power. At the end of our book, we lay out a couple of different scenarios of uh, ways that China's future could turn out, ways that we, we think are quite conceivable, and talk about the different choices that are available to Chinese society and to the Chinese government that will influence whether China is able to manage its scarcities or whether scarcity uh, ends up making choices for the Chinese government, for the Chinese future uh, people about what kind of a future they have. I think one more thing that's uh, perhaps somewhat surprising for our book is, you know, t to the extent that we that we could, we tried to uh, really step into the average Chinese shoes or Chinese policy po uh, policymakers shoes and try to think about these issues from their perspective. The core message is that China is being constrained by its success uh, at the very time that China is rising and becoming the world's largest economy. And Americans are so dazzled or, or freaked out by China's rise that it's easy to overlook that.